Climate finance has had a horrible history. There was a commitment to provide 100 billion a year coming out of a otherwise failed climate meet COP in Copenhagen. And that 100 billion has become totemic ever since because it's still not reached. And yet in truth, it's a fraction of the real needs. A real sort of revamping of our energy and infrastructure systems and the kind of changes in our economic lives is probably much more of the order of three, four, five percent of our total GDP. And that would put it anything between two to five trillion dollars a year. The hundred billion which people are fighting over is a modest down payment on a much bigger need. And at the moment, the challenge is the gap between what's needed and what's being discussed remains vast. In a strange way, this was the year when northern countries recognized what southern countries have known for a very long time, which is climate is a security issue. It's about sufficient energy to keep the home hearth lit, to keep your industrial plants turning, your heating systems working, etc. And, you know, it's now sort of driven home uh, through the Ukraine war and its impact on energy supplies and prices, this truth. And you've seen countries in Europe particularly racing to find alternative energy security strategies and supplies. But in countries in conflict, this has been obvious for a long time because often climate pressures, environmental scarcities are part of the source of conflict. We've seen situations where settled farming and herders have run into each other in Nigeria, for example, or how absence of water supply in Yemen has, has driven conflict. And, and so in truth, when the causes of conflict are so caught up with climate. You would think based on need that there was a case for more finance for war-torn countries, but the classic development think on this is where you have wars, you have weak institutions, you don't have the structures to spend uh, and invest monies effectively. So there is a natural built-in bias and tendency in development, some of it perfectly reasonable, uh, for monies to go, if you like, in a more small c conservative, risk-averse direction to, to avoid going to the difficult places where the returns may be higher, but the risks of the money going missing or not having the impact you want are also greater. My message to the leaders of COP27 is defy your critics. This is a COP with low expectation, uh, but it is the Africa COP. And, you know, the huge issue of how to handle gas transition and other transition energy strategies in the continent, the issue of recompense for the environmental damage caused by northern emissions. All these key issues are on the table. And if ever there was a time for some statesmanship and vision and to sort of get beyond uh, the agenda of today, the brutal war in Ukraine, and to look at this agenda which is going to shape the world for generations to come. It's now, so let's hope there's a little bit of statesmanship in the desert. <laughs>